Hello and welcome to ID Talk, answers from an infectious disease expert. I'm Dr. Sean Elliott, a pediatric infectious disease specialist with Tucson Medical Center, Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, and Medical Director of Infectious Diseases and Immunizations at the Arizona Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. This podcast has been created to answer questions from our chapter's members about the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the last week of March. Uh, Today is March 29th as I record this. Globally, we are at uh, over 484 million total cases of COVID-19 with 6.13 million deaths. Here in the United States, we are just over 80 million cases. That's a significant chunk of our population. Total cases, COVID-19, with 978,291 deaths as of today. Specifically to children, the report from the uh, AAP dated March 24th has us at 12.8 million total cases since the start of the pandemic with uh, night that's 19% of the total and that's 17,000 uh, per 100,000 uh, pediatric patients again on the per week basis 19.4% for the most recent uh, week that we've been talking about here in Arizona 425,405 pediatric cases um, that is 21.3% of the total uh, and that's just over 23,000 per 100,000 pediatric patients our deaths attributed to or related to COVID-19 are up to 63 since the start of the pandemic. We actually have fallen behind California in total numbers. California is up to 64. Texas is still the leader uh, at the 128 range. So not awesome numbers whatsoever, although I think we all know just from our own observations and the media that the pace of the the pandemic is slowing down. Indications continue to strengthen that we're reaching uh, endemicity. The questions this week are are sort of related to that and, and very strongly, what do we do about vaccinations ongoing for pediatric patients? The first question is that articles are saying to brace for another surge in the pandemic here in the States based on trends in other countries. What's up with that? Well, so so what we're seeing in other parts of the world is or are countries and perhaps regions in countries that are experiencing a prolonged Omicron surge due to BA2, that that is the sub-variant number two of the Omicron virus itself. So not a brand new variant, not a new threat per se, but a sub-variant which emerged at the same time as the Omicron BA1, which we know and love here in the States, but the BA2 or or South Omicron is another 30 to at most 50% more contagious. So more at-risk patients that may develop symptoms and seek health care but there are no indications that it is any more virulent than Omicron BA1, which which we are just now recovering from. And and similarly, uh, the patients who are being infected and affected by Omicron are those with significant underlying comorbidities and primarily those who remain un or under vaccinated. Yes, absolutely, vaccinated and boosted individuals are being infected, but by and large, their symptoms are relatively mild and minor. I'm saying relatively because those of you who have experienced uh, uh, COVID and due to Omicron, uh, despite vaccination boosting, will be very rapid to challenge me and say, that was no joke whatsoever. I'm still coughing. I'm still tired. But the point being that that a majority of vaccinated boosted children and adults uh, did not wind up in EDs or, or hospitals due to that disease specifically. Those who did had underlying comorbidities that were triggered into exacerbation, such as COPD, chronic lung disease in adults, diabetes for all age ranges, and in kids, especially those um, who already have wheezing associated with respiratory illness or reactive airway disease, triggered into more of a respiratory uh, exacerbation by the Omicron. So needed to put that down on paper first um, before we talk about what the experience in other parts of the world might mean for the United States. And and it is true, for example, China is experiencing a a cluster of cases and in historic and accurate Chinese fashion uh, reacted very uh, strongly by by closing down the entire community. That is what they did um, largely to great effect, actually, in in Wuhan province at, at the start of all this. Other parts of the world, including in Europe, parts of the Americas, similarly are experiencing clusters of cases. But in every case, um, this is not necessarily a brand new huge surge. Uh, It is instead a prolongation or a new emergence of a cluster uh, of cases that that was perhaps not completely planned for. 
what does that mean for the states? And, and that, that's what the questioner is asking. Really hard to say, sadly, um, that there, there was a, a significant train of thought here in the states that we may not experience any more than just a, a continued gradual, perhaps slower than expected tapering of the current Omicron surge. And we're already tapering quite significantly. The reason for that is that the United States, because of perhaps our approach uh, of some of our population to vaccinations, we had a rip roaring surge with Omicron BA1 which means that a significant portion of the population uh, in this country were infected and have right now robust natural immunity. Yes, you will point out, I have talked to you before about how that natural immunity does not remain protective for very long, but it does remain protective for at least three months and perhaps even a bit longer. So right now, this country is super seroprotected against Omicron of any iteration, BA1, BA2, or BA3. And add to that those individuals uh, who, who are vaccinated and boosted. Um, so, so not approaching herd immunity, but but certainly we're, we're closer than we might have been prior to Delta. So the suggestion is that any toehold that BA2 grabs here in the states, and there are cases accounting for 30% of new cases right now, is not likely to create any new explosion of cases, and certainly not any new explosion of healthcare need other than perhaps a continued slowing of the tapering, if that makes sense, uh, of the Omicron surge. So by and large, we're, we're sitting kind of pretty with, with the hope that, that we're not expecting anything huge to come our way in the near future. Other variants, yeah, of course, there, there are always going to be other variants. That's what this virus does. I've said it before, and it will keep being said by anybody who follows the viral trends. Right now, what's out there are combination variants. I think you may have heard the term Delta Cron, which is a combination of, of the Delta variant and a version of Omicron, whether it's BA1 or BA2. And that, that actually has been described and, and found in clusters of cases in the United Kingdom and, and parts of Europe. However, the combination variants like Delta Cron are, are little flashes in the pan. Um, not to minimize them, of course, but th they're not being associated with any huge increase in virulence, attack rate, infectivity, or anything like that. So, so right now the picture, or the threat board, I guess, uh, is, is relatively benign, just as we monitor what's happening uh, with BA2, both overseas and, and here in this country. Next question. Um, there are reports about the Pfizer vaccine being less effective in children ages 5 uh, through 11 years uh, as compared to older adolescents. Uh, what is up with that and, and where are we at actually in terms of Pfizer vaccine induced immunity for all pediatric age groups? That there, it is actually a report, singular, with, with a couple carry-ons coming from um, the state of New York Health Department. And there was a Oh, a retrospective analysis of population data released by New York that, that found a, a very low protective efficacy of vaccination in children ages 5 to 11, as, as low as 11% against all disease and around 40% protecting against severe disease. The challenge is that data uh, was, was collected perhaps not as statistically benignly um, as other prospective population studies have been. There was definite potential for reporter bias, uh, for selection bias, and a couple other biases as well. So, so anyone who has reviewed the data and has not yet been published uh, in a peer-reviewed journal is cautioning against taking away from, the, from that report that the Pfizer vaccine does not work. Instead, in other population studies that have been performed prospectively and in other parts of the country and, and actually in other parts of the world, so with Israel, uh, European Union, etc., there, there is strong suggestion that Pfizer vaccine retains its initial demonstrated efficacy of around 70% uh, against uh, infection, perhaps as low as 50 to 60% against all infection, including Omicron, but continued high level protection against uh, serious disease in those who are boosted. Obviously, we, we're not yet boosting uh, youngers at this point, that, that's ages 12 and up, but so far, ages 5 through 11 in the rest of the country have not been experiencing uh, any significant change in infectivity, uh, especially when they've been vaccinated with, with, do with both doses. 
So true for, for 12 through uh, 16 for Pfizer and uh, 12 through 18 for Moderna, uh, although Moderna is, is still waiting to get uh, emergency use authorization for younger children, apparently going to the FDA to get uh, ages six months to five years e-emergency use authorization uh, in the, the hopefully near future. But so far, both vaccines remain as robust as we can anticipate against Omicron and, and remain a very good idea. So yes, I, I continue to fully support vaccinating uh, uh, the younger children with two doses uh, of the Pfizer. And if and or when a booster dose is, is uh, officially approved, then that sounds reasonable as well. Booster doses in older patients, age 12 and up, uh, definitely found to carry a significant added efficacy uh, uh, to the first two doses in preventing Omicron infection altogether, um, although not 100%, but significantly protected against severe or hospitalized disease. So, so boosters remain a, a very definite uh, good idea. And uh, what about those, those kids who have had uh, natural disease Yes, they should still be immunized. If anything, now is the time to do that, um, to, to give a, a significant heterologous boost to their immunity. So, so that all sounds good. Just today, as I'm recording this, the FDA has come out uh, in support of booster doses of both Moderna and Pfizer for ages 50, 50 and up, all included, and also for ages 12 years and up for those children who have immunosuppression due to, for example, solid organ transplantation or, or severe underlying immunodeficiency. So that, that is still a, a smaller number than, than the general population, but it's not insignificant. And certainly those are children 12 and up who are at high risk of severe disease and, and morbidity related to COVID-19 should they become infected with, with uh, uh, Omicron or, or any other variant. So stay tuned for more on that. Certainly, hopefully we'll have more information regarding uh, emergency use authorization for vaccines uh, in children less than age five. Um, I, I think we are all aware, and, we, and I discussed in the last podcast, how, how the, the initial reaction by the FDA to, to pull the data from Pfizer in hopes of a rapid emergency use authorization, what was retracted uh, largely due to emerging data from Omicron. And, and Pfizer, I think very appropriately said, you know, hey, look, you know, our, our vaccine is, is good, but it's not as good as we would have liked. Give us some more time to, to test a third dose um, and perhaps even to play with the dosing. Wouldn't that be great um, to, to get the ideal vaccine delivery, vaccine frequency and vaccine dose uh, for younger children? Meanwhile, uh, I at least eagerly anticipate seeing or hearing about Moderna's data because in general, Moderna has been providing higher, higher seroprotective levels of antibodies and, and perhaps even a bit more robust of a boost even to those getting the, the Pfizer mRNA. This is not an endorsement in any way of either vaccine product, simply an observation that, that in terms of driving a seroprotective response, the Moderna vaccine, which is a higher dose, may be a, a bit more eff effective in the younger children once we get that data. Fingers are crossed. Last question, uh, how long after a COVID-19 infection should a fully immunized person wait to get a booster? And is it the same recommendation for each age group? It is the same recommendation, again, keeping in mind that, that boosters are, are just for uh, and in the Pfizer for, uh, for 12 and up, and we don't yet have a booster authorization under uh, age 12. However, the, the recommendation uh, is to wait just 10 days 10 days after diagnosis with, with uh, natural uh, infection with SARS coronavirus 2, um, basically so the patient is no longer symptomatic and, and more importantly, no longer contagious when they present to the vaccine site, such as our offices, public health vaccine sites, et cetera, and so forth. You, you may have heard or have read that there's a three month window to, to wait. Uh, that is really intended for individuals who received a monoclonal antibody infusion or perhaps some other antibody infusion uh, as part of their natural COVID infection. That, that is a very small number, uh, certainly under age 12, because again, it's not approved for those. So, so unless you know your, your patient received monoclonal antibody or was hospitalized and received intravenous immunoglobulin or even pooled antibody from a COVID survivor, then, then there's no reason to wait the three months, just 10 days. So that, that's kind of where we're at, folks. It's an interesting time, I think, as we all uh, look at and eagerly anticipate a downward escalation of both the pandemic and the response to it. 
yet at the same time it makes it that much more difficult to, to try and get patients into the office, into the practices for COVID interventions, COVID vaccines, and along with those, all of the other preventative health care steps which we still yet wish to and need to be performing, especially routine vaccination. So uh, be advised that that the chapter and, and uh, the national AP uh, are partnering uh, rigorously and, and robustly with schools and, and other uh, uh, team members, uh, health, health team members, um, to, to try and get the kids back into medical home in the general practice, to try and get the kids back for uh, routine preventative vaccinations, not letting go of the message that we still yet need to fight COVID, but, but trying to, to adapt it somewhat to, to get the whole patient back in for whole care. Uh, um, and obviously that that's a very important thing for us to be uh, try, trying to make happen. Meanwhile, all the signs are that uh, COVID-19 is currently winding down uh, until or if a new variant might emerge. Omicron um, was a significant player in this pandemic by be creating a much more infective yet yet less uh, virulent virus that, that has a greater survival advantage. COVID-19 is, is becoming a survivable infection similar to the flu and RSV and all the other fun viruses we encounter in an epidemic form every year. And by and large, at least in our patient population, most kids do quite well. So um, the, the hope is to continue to, to achieve a seroprotective status for the community to keep it that way. Hence the, the wish to move forward with vaccinations and if and or when a vaccine product is, is tested, efficacious, and safe in kids less than five to, to move rapidly to vaccinate that population as well, really to sort of close the loop on, on protecting our society. So that is it for this week. Thank you as always for listening to ID Talk. Arizona AAP members can submit questions for future episodes to covid at azaap.org. Uh, the AZAAP would like to acknowledge the generous support of this podcast by the Arizona Department of Health Services through the Title V Maternal and Child Health Services Block Grant funding. For more information and resources related to COVID-19 in Arizona, or to learn how to become a member, please visit us at azaap.org. In the meantime, and as always, hang in there, keep breathing, work in the wellness, and keep the questions rolling in. Thanks, everyone. 